and let's uh, let's get you know let's get started quickly. Just maybe we can do a general update. Um, we you know we we chatted a couple of weeks ago, um, which seems like forever ago, um, mm -hmm. regarding regarding um, issues around you know people and finance and sales and and um, you know how to how to lead our organizations in times of uncertainty. So you know I don't know if um, we didn't necessarily prepare anything. Um, to, to speak, but if you guys have any sort of thoughts about um, the past couple of weeks or the next couple of weeks, what, you're, what you've observed, what you've learned, what you're hearing from clients. Sure, um, I can start off on the HR side of the house. Um, and for those of you, I'm Marsha O'Connor, um, owner of the O'Connor Group, and we do outsourced HR and outsourced recruiting. And so we're doing a lot of work right now, webinars on furloughs and layoffs still. And I think there is a panic move, and I'm sure Jeff, you can um, talk more about this, about the PPP being so slow coming in for a lot of small businesses. And so I think that there is that fear of trying to, how to save my business now versus, you know, what's next. It's more like, um, how can we save it um, from going under because the next two weeks are pretty critical. I also think what I'm starting to see next month, we might see a little bit more of um, PSTD and um, people actually having a really, really rough time mentally. And so we're starting to see the beginnings of what we're going to do to try to help our, our employees manage through that chaos right now. Because another month of this is, is, is really wearing on a lot of people, especially people with small kids. So those are two of the top things that we've been seeing right now. Super. That's helpful. Lisa, Great, I can jump in. Oh, sure. Jeff. Yeah, sure, sure. Sure. Jeff Bruno, your outsource CFO. I think most people on here uh, uh, should uh, from last time. So good to see you again. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's been very heavy around, uh, you know, the government programs. Uh, it's been, uh, uh, I actually received an email for my own business uh, today that I'll be getting funding actual dollars tomorrow uh, from the PVP. So my application was approved on April 3rd. So Dollars are definitely starting to come in. Uh, other clients, a couple have received them. So um, as of uh, today, or as of Sunday, 210 billion of the 350 billion was um, approved by the SBA. So it has gone extremely fast, uh, you know, just under 10 days, uh, 210 billion. So uh, people are saying the program could end by Wednesday or Thursday from a funding standpoint, unless, the government puts more funding in. So what we're starting to do now is move towards um, next steps. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. So. Hey, Jeff, real quick, thing. because a lot of people are asking this question out there, small business, what bank basically approved you? Uh, that was Mid Penn Bank, a local, local smaller bank. Um, so they were, they were fast, they were streamlined. They were one of the first to have the applications up online. I think the first one, if not the first in the area. Um, and um, they're seeing a huge upturn in business from this, which is great for them. Um, so- Which bank, oh, sorry, I missed that, Jeff. Which bank? Mid Penn Bank. Mid Penn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things we're hearing is a lot of frustration with the big banks um, and and I think I, I, it took me about a day to, with PNC to get my application in, and I, I'm number 44,000. Wow. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know what year, but um, what year we'll see it. But, but uh, you know, I hear a lot of talk in the, in the small business community about going back to local banks now, um, regional banks, where you have a relationship with your banker. The two that have been most successful for our clients were Republic and Mid Penn Bank. Yeah, Republic is the, I have their website up in my browser right now. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you, Lisa. So hello everybody, my name is Lisa Peskin. My company is Business Development University. Everything we do is really all about getting salespeople to be as successful as possible, whether it's training, coaching, or consulting. Um, we're finding during this time two major things from a sales perspective people are unsure of what the smartest thing that they should be doing right now. They're questioning whether or not they can be making prospecting calls or outreach calls um, at this point in time. A lot of them are finding that they need to pivot and figure out what their game plan needs to be moving forward. And then from a sales leader perspective, how do you manage your folks when they're all remote? 
How do you make sure that they're doing the proper activities? And what can you be doing to make sure you're developing your salespeople, holding them accountable without letting them off the hook? So what I'm finding that the proactive companies out there are understanding that instead of just sitting back and waiting for this to all be over, they're positioning themselves as strategically and with the right tactics, so they're going to be in the best position moving forward. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm Mike Krupit, uh, the uh, founder of Trajectify, a uh, coaching practice in business growth and leadership development. Uh, one of the things that um, I can share is, and this was, this was, I guess it should have been expected, but I wasn't prepared for it. But I spoke with a fair number of clients last week who are actually doing well. Um, a few of them said that March is up over April and they're finding new opportunities and they're pretty excited about those opportunities and the impact on the business. Plus they've put in place all of these best practices to respond to the crisis as well as respond to the remote work environment. And all of those are beginning to pay off in terms of productivity and effectiveness. And now the challenge is they're feeling guilty about it. When you see the suffering that's happening around you, they're, they're dealing with the fact that, but things are going well, they shouldn't go well for me. And so that's an interesting um, emotional and psychological barrier to get over. Um, you know, and you know, not knowing that not everybody is gonna hurt, some people will do well, and, and the people who are hurting do want the people the do want others to do well. Um, and so, so some interesting phenomenons going on. Um, so why don't we, um, we, we, can, we can keep talking, but I, what I'd love to do is just see if anyone like wants to raise their hand. Let me, let me maybe a little bit of housekeeping since this was structured as a webinar format. Um, so people are gonna have to raise their hands or ask a question. There's a Q and A. Um, you can raise your hand in the panel, uh, on the, uh, the menu bar below the videos. Um, there's a Q&A panel where you can ask a question. There's a chat room where you can ask a question, or you can just raise your hand. Um, we, we're happy to turn over the microphone, you know, you know unmute anybody who wants to um, contribute a question. Um, you know, if not, I'll keep asking questions. I'd love to, you know, maybe ask questions of some of the participants as well. So, um, so, so please don't be shy in terms of raising your hand. Uh, you know, this is, we, we've been calling this workshop, not webinar, because we really want to make it as collaborative as possible. Um, so your participation is helpful. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to put you on mute and listen to another webinar. No, just, just kidding. <laughs> we were joking earlier about how, how some of us are on webinars, multiple webinars simultaneously. <clears throat> I promise you I'm not on another webinar right now. Um, so, so Jeff, uh, let's let's talk a little bit more about about finances because that uh, what I'm hearing from a lot of companies is my PPP money isn't coming through. What do I do, right? And and they don't, you know, maybe they got notified by the bank that we have your application, or maybe in the rare case that it's been approved, but virtually no one who I'm working with is, you know, unlike yourself, has heard that you know your money's you're going to get your money on such and such a date. So, sure. so there's, they're struggling to plan. What do I, what do I do? Not knowing if or when I'll get it. Sure. Uh, it's a lot to unpack here, but um, let me just give some overall updates and uh, I'll try to uh, split this up a little too, but um, uh, just to give an idea of, of our full client base. So we are seeing some updates on some other loans as well. So that the city, the city program, that's the $5,000 grant. Um, uh, we have, and the $25,000 grant, we uh, have received, two clients have received portions, one of 5,000 and one a portion of the 25,000. So the city is starting to get those monies, or not received, have received approval that they're getting it. They've not received the funds yet. But the city seems to be making traction on that. So that should be facilitated over the next two weeks, I would think. That money will be coming through. The state, oh, and the, um, the uh, three to $5 million businesses from the city as well, uh, for the $100,000 note, up to $100,000 note. That is also proceeding and should be wrapped up uh, shortly uh, and money should be flowing there as well. Um, the state funds are, are really slow. The state was uh, behind uh, both technology-wise and application-wise. Um, so nobody has too much of an idea of when that's going to come out. That's $61 million from the state. Um, uh, but hopefully this month uh, to businesses. And, and really those are 
Um, those should be viewed as, as almost like plug money to get you to the PPP or to get you to the next, next level. Uh, it's just not gonna be enough funding for, your, for a lot of businesses. Um, the PPP, uh, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, it is starting to come through. Republic and MidPen have been doing very well with that. Um, I've heard PNC did get their act together. Um, Wells Fargo, unfortunately, stopped lending again, stopped taking applications again. Um, so there's a lot of problems with the, some of the bigger banks, um, but I would anticipate that that's going to start coming through. I mean, uh, there, there's a backlog there. Um, so I would hope that by the end of the month, most of the PP funding is out. Um, although I can't speak to it entirely, but that's where we're positioning clients for. Um, and, uh, um, there's one other thing to mention. I could send it around as, as a follow-up to everybody post this. Uh, there was a grant, a grant or a loan, I have to look it up again, from Montgomery County that came out last week as well for businesses in Montgomery County only. So I don't know if people saw that, uh, but if there are businesses here, there is something separate from all of this from Montgomery County. Um, Thank you. Sure. It's a grant, but yeah. Grant. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that's sort of the update of where everything sits. Um, and we're kind of moving to, into the next stage with clients. Um, and that stage is really how do we position cash and how do we look at projections? But I'll, I'll hold off on some of that for a minute. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to check out one of the, one of the uh, questions. Um, so, so Nick is asking, <clears throat> excuse me, Nick is asking about the, uh, the scarcity of the loan money. Um, well, it's maybe it's more 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 a macroeconomic yeah. question about about um, about you know what I'm reading into it is you know other inflation consequences. Does the like what what happens in the in the after? What do you think happens in the aftermath of all this with our economy having given away all this money that we don't have? I, that is a very macro question. Um, I mean, one of my clients actually asked me, is inflation going to go up a lot? I was like, well, <laughs> you know, maybe, uh, possibly. <laughs> we don't know yet. But uh, I think that I think that's why I would ask people to, and this is one of the things I've been telling our clients. Like one of my clients asked me yesterday or, or uh, Friday, should I take all the money from the PPP? Should, what if I don't, if I can't use it all or get forgiveness for all of it? And I said, yes, take it. So it's 1%. Um, so that's kind of the position we're saying. So as far as that, I, I don't know what it's going to do. There's certainly a lot of extra dollars out there, um, mm -hmm. but businesses should take it right now if they can get it. So. Yeah. And I, and I think there, you know, we still, there's a lot of economic uncertainty even after these programs, right? You know, the businesses that even with PPP that won't survive, especially when we look at, the, you know, restaurants and hospitality and other sectors that are, uh, um, you know, particularly hard hit um, that, you know, what, what is it like for them to come back or if they don't come back and those loans get ultimately forgiven or, or chapter 11 or seven, and then all of a sudden, you know, now we're making new loans to new restaurants and new, new host, you know, hotels starting up. Um, so it could, it could be a snowball effect. Um, so, I mean, it, the lesson that I'm hearing in that is we, we should just be prepared for anything, right? And this is a, you know, the, the way we described it a, a couple of weeks ago is the race, not chase scenario that you need to really try to be in the race and get ahead of this and not, not always trying to be catching up from a financial perspective. Yes. Um, um, <clears throat> so let me, let me ask um, uh, Marsha, um, you know, regarding some of the, 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 um, the, the, the furloughed employees, right? So now once these PPP money, you know, once these PPP dollars come back, what are, what, what are business owners, what, 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 not come back, but once, what, once they're received, do business owners start rehiring the people that they let go? Are there recommendations that you have or, or clients that are preparing for how to handle the fact that they may have a little bit of money in the bank for a short period of time? Um, they are, but they're actually, you had to bring your people back um, right now before end of June and in order to get the full amount of the PPP. But there's still a lot of ambiguity there, Mike. 
because like, for example, if you have a part-time person right now who doesn't have any work and she goes on furlough, you know, she's only working three days a week. Does that mean, you know, we get that money, do we bring them back immediately at three days a week or do we have to bring them back before end of June to prove that we brought this person back and we were using some of the funds to pay her. So there's still a lot of ambiguity going on out there. Um, what we are finding right now too is a little change of heart that the furloughs um, that are happening out there, some of my um, clients, because they're letting go people, um, there's claims coming in for um, age discrimination and um, different other areas because people are like, well, I was the oldest and they furloughed me or they laid me off and they furloughed other people. So you better be sure you have a really good documentation system um, for everybody and try to be as consistent as possible right now. I know a lot of people are trimming the fat and letting go and laying off people that they probably should have laid off and put on a pip six months ago, um, but then they're furloughing others. Just be really careful of how you communicate that and how you document that because we just had another um, instance last week where he furloughed somebody and she's claiming it, um, you know, that he was furloughed because of COVID and she's just like, I don't think so. I think it's because of my age. So now she's suing him and now you got to get an employment attorney involved. And um, so a lot of that's going on right now. And she, my employment attorney we work with, she said, or she goes, oh, this won't be the first and it definitely won't be the last. That's, an, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but, but certainly whenever we're advising companies who are looking to you know, lay, do layoffs or, or downsizings, how to fairly implement them. But I think people reacted in such crisis mode. They, you know, they either didn't get that advice or didn't listen to that advice. They didn't ask, they just did it. You know, they just went ahead. Um, yeah, so, so um, it, it kind of speaks to why um, we, need to, we need to, before we take any actions with respect to money or people, take a, take a step back and think about what it is that we're doing. And we have to be careful the other way too. So what I'm hearing as well is the people that who are making less than $50,000 a year and now they're unemployed and now they're making $600 more in their unemployment check, some of them are making more money now than they did working full time. So that's probably going to last until the end of July. And if you want that person back now, I mean, they're going to be apprehensive about doing that because they're making more money right now being unemployed. So you're going to have a lot of angry employers too saying, I need you back. And they're like, yeah, I'm not ready yet. I'm a little afraid and using the COVID as an excuse too. So you got to be very careful out there and make sure you're, t you're on top of your team and you're having the daily the check-ins and all too. But it's a lot of fine lines right now. And uh, one more question. Nick had a follow-up question that I, I, I kind of want to ask regarding the PPP. Um, and, and we don't know, there are some high-level rules about what will be forgiven, but I think they're just focused so much on getting the money out there that they're not really focused on the details about what's going to be forgiven. But, you know, can I use that money to out, you know, is there a chance that that'll be forgiven if I use it to outsource work as opposed to rehire employees or hire independent contractors who would work for me in the past? I don't know that answer yet. I mean, Jeff, I still you? think it's, from what I hear, it's supposed to be the, the current employees that you currently have or had up to a certain time frame. those are the ones you're supposed to keep them employed as much as possible. Yeah. But I know the rules are changing, so I don't know what that answer is really going to be. Well, new hires definitely count because it's, as far as I know, it is a FTE, full-time equivalent uh, marker. So, yes. um, yeah, to Lisa's point, new salespeople, uh, if you have an opportunity or if you have to pivot your business to a different sales channel because of this, mm -hmm. which some are doing, um, this is a good time to maybe get in that sales manager or new salesperson. Um, that would count as a, as a, you know, reposition scenario. So. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Lisa, uh, prospecting. So last week, I, I took your advice from two weeks ago, and I started my prospecting campaign. I'm Matt with me. Um, uh, last week, uh, testing new messages, being more specific about how we can help in this time. And we tested a few different offerings, a few different messages. Um, I think we've got no nibbles on the prospecting. So while we still have a pipeline um, that we're not losing sleep over because we're still having calls, um, we're still closing deals, you know, it's, you know, I'm thinking about what happens in two, three months down the road. Um, so I know there's a lot of work that we need to do to figure out how to get there. 
but we're finding a hard time getting um, a share of a prospect's mind. I mean, they're being inundated not only with their own situation, but with other messages from everyone from their hotels telling them what they're doing about COVID-19 to their, you know, their, their service providers who are trying to help them, um, you know, with offers. So what, um, and, you know, what are, what are you telling, what are, what are you sharing with your clients as to how to move forward with their prospecting? Well, I, I think that all your sentiments that you just expressed, um, we're all feeling to different levels, right? And the fact of the matter is not everything works for everybody and not everything works in every situation. So we're going to have to try different tactics and start figuring out what's going to work. The other thing is, I use the word just like you did, prospecting as opposed to cold calling. And I believe it's got to be a multi-pronged approach. So I was talking to a client earlier today and I said, your targets now are not your same targets before this. So let's readjust your top 50 list. And then let's multi-purpose with the top 50 list. For instance, he's having, he just got a great referral from a center of influence. So I said, I want to get that top 50 list together so that you could share it with your centers of influences and see if they know of anybody at any of those companies. It's a very simple tactic, right? But it's another way to get into them. The other thing is make sure you're going on LinkedIn, seeing does anyone in your network know anyone that works at that company or anybody in your network connected to the person that you're trying to get in touch with. You could send them webinar information. You could reach out to them about an article. There's so many different ways you could reach out, but more importantly than anything else, it's got to be genuine. It's got to be about helping and you've got to have really good talking points. So if you go out and say, I just want to talk to you about my product or service, it's going to come off that you're trying to sell them something. Instead, approach it from, I'd love to have a conversation and see if I have some ideas that might be helpful for you. And if you do that, then just setting up some preliminary conversations. And I'm telling you, there are people that are getting business now. They're getting appointments. I had one woman, she made 10 calls, got five people on the phone. So there is business happening. You might need to make more um, calls and emails and whatever, but there are people that want to have discussions and there is business that's happening right now during this crazy time. Clearly. Pretty excited talking to all of you <laughs> about that, but you know what? We could, we could look at it one way or another. We could look at it as woe is me, or we could look at it as what are the things I can do right now? I'm spending so much time listening to podcasts right now. You just get one or two ideas that you could take and implement, set yourself goals, and make sure you're holding yourself accountable to goals. And if you're a sales leader, make sure you're setting clear expectations with your salespeople and making sure that they're not only willing to do what they've said they're going to do, but committed to doing it. Thank you. Um, any, no hands yet? Any, any other hands? Cause I'll, I'll keep going with questions. Um, and we don't, um, maybe Matt, you said that we still have some polls here. Um, um, I don't want to launch the same polls that we launched last time, but those are the questions that are in there. Um, I don't know, maybe we should, so one of the, cause one of the questions I have for you guys is, well, well for the, for the, you know, for, um, for those who are, who are listening on the call is um, how many of you were directly impacted in terms of having to downsize some of your staff? If you can just like show your hands, um, I can lower your hands later, but um, if you just hit the, uh, the raise hand button, just out of curiosity to see, you know, how many of you have had to uh, do a staff reduction? That's either no one or they have us on mute because they're listening to another webinar <laughs> or they can't find the raise hand button. Um, probably the, the, the latter. <laughs> um, and, and I don't know that I get to see the raise hand button because 
I'm the host. So I can't Maybe even. Maybe they can enter it into the chat. Oh, I see. Well, one, I, I see one hand. Okay. So Nick has found the raise hand button. Um, okay. We got a couple. All right, we have a couple. So, um, it, no, it, it was interesting. So, so last week I was I was doing a, a, a I was the host on, I was a, a guest host on a on a webinar for um, a business network, and there were a couple of like caterers and restaurateurs in there that were really struggling. Right, you know, they, they the answer was we don't want to put people in the kitchen, and we have no business left anyhow, even if we were to find a way to pivot. So uh, they they let go of all their employees. And um, and we're you know the, the the founders of those business were looking for other sources of income in the meantime, hoping that the PPP would eventually come through to them. <clears throat> but on the same call are people who are finding opportunities, as I shared before, and and are able to move forward. And it and it seems like, you know, my my, my rough estimate is, and maybe the economy sort of reflects that, is at least locally, as I'm seeing at least. 75% of businesses, as, as sort of the show of hands has already demonstrated, who, who may not have a immediate negative um, economic or, or people-oriented impact. Um, so one of the questions that um, for those businesses that I would have is, what should we be prepared for next? Um, so for those of us who didn't have that, you know, weren't hit in the face with a, a, a hammer on day one, um, who are still moving forward with our businesses, maybe even doing, doing as well, or maybe even a little bit better, who haven't been hurt enough to have to, you know, drop everything we're doing and take a huge step back. What do we prepare for next, right? What, what does May or, or, or June bring for us that we should be getting ready for? Uh, I mean, I could speak that a little bit. Uh, if I may, um, I mean, we're, we're big believers that, you know, in, in the typical American fashion, uh, you know, competition arises fast uh, to uh, adapt to the scenarios. So if you think you're going to do a certain level of revenue in a new COVID cleaning crew that you put together, um, I'm sure that's true. But I would be careful to estimate too high levels of that because other cleaning crews are going to be starting. So we're putting very, very, we're looking out um, minimum six to nine months uh, with clients we're thinking and people that are doing okay. And we're thinking that there are going to be further disruptions as it looks like it's evidence in the world here with uh, outbreaks coming back um, and things of that nature. So we think it's going to be a very choppy, continual choppy demand situation. So whatever revenue targets people are looking to come back to, they should be discounted heavily um, to watch the ebb and flow of, and make sure you have much more cash on hand or at least leverage on hand through this period, um, you know, uh, to, to get through the consistent up and down. So we're, we're, we're pushing uh, very, very tight controls on that. What would you recommend? You have a, a guidance for, let's say businesses up to, 10 or 15 million, how much operating reserves they should, they should be holding? Well, historically, we've seen businesses, at least our clients are holding like on average a month and a half, some two weeks, some three months of liquidity, you know, whether it's uh, just straight up liquidity from, you know, lines and cash and other things, or, you know, I think the new, new thing on liquidity is you can't count on your AR as much right now. So, I would look at your lines, look at your cash, look at your personal situation. And really for your business, you should be north of three months at a minimum. I mean, I would say you want to be at four, four months or, or more even uh, these days, just due to the consistent, consistent disruption. Um, so um, we're also actively reaching out to banks that businesses have been doing well to your point earlier and saying, hey, let's extend those lines if the bank's willing to do it. Um, there's an overarching kind of a little bit of understanding with the banks that if your your financials were good through the end of 19 and you're still hanging in there, they might give you a little extension on some lines. Um, so we're pushing that uh, as well. So 
Thank you, Jeff. What, what, Marsha? What about in terms of our our organizations? Like, what do we, what, what do we start communicating? What do we start planning for in May and June? What can we tell them now? Yeah, we talked about this this morning with my team. Actually, it's about when people are coming back off of furloughs, and what is that going to look like? Are they going into the office? Do they have to go back into the office? Are they going to be temperature checked? Do they feel comfortable going back into the office? Can they work remote? Do they have a remote handbook? You know, what's covered, what's not? So it's basically putting um, all those tips and tools together right now to address all those concerns because they're definitely going to come back and people will have to figure out, well, how come they're staying at home and I can't stay at home? And why, he, why this person, not that person? And that's not age discrimination. So you're going to have a lot of different things to be thinking about, but it's definitely going to come back. And I imagine you have to figure out, you know, to make the business work, how creative, how flexible are you going to be? Agility is going to be a humongous word used right now. The next, um, not just six months, for, for like a couple of years. <laughs> it's not a bad skill to have, though. True. Very true. Very resilient and all, too. But I think also a lot of really new, innovative ideas are going to come through this, too. Things that we never thought of before. Like today, we had at, at lunchtime, we usually have every day a 15-minute team huddle. And I said, you know what, let's do an innovative haul. And so today for a full hour, we put on our thinking caps and I had a big poster board behind me on Zoom and I wrote out every new idea they had to say, why don't we do this and why don't we do that? They came up with 40 ideas. And I said, that's phenomenal. And I said, there's some really good ideas in there. So let's put together small teams of action to get them moving and to see where it takes us and all too. So, they're definitely on the same page where we're all working together, but it's that creativity, that flexibility, that out of the box thinking that's gonna, you know, make us survive, I guess you could say. Pretty cool. Great. By so, the way, that- something. Thanks, Lise. Um, regarding um, online whiteboards, uh, one of my colleagues turned me on to a website called Mural, mural.co. And it's a shared online whiteboard where you can put post-it notes and scribbles and type things. Um, so kind of like a shared Google Doc, but really meant to be a, a for a, you know a, a whiteboard for a meeting. So we've been using that with um, with clients, and it's working. It's working very well. Mike, how do you spell it? M mural m u r a l dot c o I believe. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Thanks for the tip. Love it. That's great to know for me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lisa. Um, the uh, so so we know that we're adapting our sales processes now and and prospecting instead of cold calling. Um, you know many many businesses right the ones that at least that are not direct to consumer might have anywhere from you know six to nine to perhaps twelve month sales cycles. Um, you know how you know if if we go forward what we want to do in the end by the end of this year and we work backwards, it's sort of incongruent with where we are today when you know how, how do we you know other than being agile which is which is a you know a great way for marsh to have framed it how do we get back to normal in terms of how we used to sell or do we never go back to how we used to sell you know i've been asked that question so many times in the past month or so what is the back to normal and i think to marsh's point i think that it's really changed and it's going to stay changed. I think that we're finding that we can get a lot accomplished virtually. And I think that the way we've traditionally done things in the past are not necessarily going to be happening for a very long time. So with that said, my brain always thinks in terms of 30, 60, 90. And especially with so many things changing right now, have your game plan for the next 30 days. Be very clear. Now, there's some things you might want to accomplish on a quarterly basis. You just divide it by three, it becomes a monthly basis, right? But always looking at a rolling 30, 60, 90 day game plan, I think is really critical. And the other thing that you said, Mike, is sometimes we're dealing with some very long sales cycles. I was talking to one of my clients this morning that does marketing research in the pharma space, and they have some accounts that could be really long sales cycles, 
but they're getting some really quick hits right now. So again, we've got to look at where our short-term opportunities are and where are the long-term opportunities and have strategies and tactics with very specific SMART goals, activity and result goals that can be measured. And we do it on a 30, 60, 90 day basis. So, you know, if you're asking me what's gonna happen in May and June, there's still so much uncertainty right now. So we've got to really focus on what can we do right now. And Marsha, to your point of just brainstorming, it's amazing what we can do when we focus on, instead of what we can't do, what we can do whether it's a new product offering, a new way to package things, or a new market that we're going after. So there are so many opportunities, and it's those of us who are gonna think about the opportunities as opposed to the obstacles that are gonna be in a much better position when things start loosening up a little bit. Thank you. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna launch a poll. Um, we, uh, given, given we have um, enough participants, we did this poll last time, and I want to see if the, um, if, the um, if the answers are any different. Um, the question is, when do you think we recover? And so we'll have a, a small representative um, sample, representative not in the Gallup sense, but in the fact that I'm not quite sure who's here, so... I'm voting too. Random. Yes, I know I opened it up to the, the panelists to vote too. So I figured let's, um, and I don't think, I don't think anybody, is anybody seeing the results? No, is it just me? I have to share the results when I end the poll. Yeah, share it. Okay, all right, I'll wait and give it a few seconds. We've got 60% voted, the other 15% don't know or are listening to another webinar. All right, all right, it's slowed down. I'm gonna end the polling. I'm gonna share the results. There we go. <laughs> um, so if we look at it as a semi-normal curve, I mean, it's people are thinking, you know, we're half a year away on average, right? Um, no less, you know, a, a few more optimistic about the summer, but, um, you know, fall to the end of the year seems to be the vast consensus of it. Um, super. And the one other, um, let's see, nope, oh, relaunch polling, nope, cancel, that's not what I wanted to do. How can I find polls? Stop, oh, I didn't stop sharing, that's why. <clears throat> Pretty soon we're all gonna become expert at Zoom and then it's gonna implode and there'll be something new. Um, no, that's not the question I wanted to launch, it was, All right, so this one is, what's your biggest concern? So of the, of the attendees out there, um, you know, which one area is, you know, keeping you up at night? Can't, we can't vote. Yeah, I didn't know, I didn't do the panels. I didn't do the panelists on this one, sorry. Okay. watching the results come in, but it is, <laughs> there's a clear winner in this one. Lisa, you'll know what it is. Um, <clears throat> all right, I'm gonna close the poll because I don't wanna, but it's, it is it is sales, 67% um, are, um, are focused on sales right now. Um, well, that's where everybody needs to be focusing on right now. And, you know, I, I almost feel, and Marsh and the other panelists, um, I'm curious, um, I almost feel like the, the initial shock is over. And now we're kind of at a different phase where, you know, we were scrambling for the first couple of weeks, but now it is very different. And People are readjusting. So I think that the fact that everybody is focusing and, and maybe concerned a little bit um, on sales, but that's really where we've got to have a little game plan. We're, we got to be done with winging it right now. Um, so many salespeople and sales leaders wing it every single day. And now more importantly, we got to focus on what we can do proactively 
Um, and not, you know, I know we're all doing our individual webinars, but on Friday at 12, we're doing a sales therapy session and at two o'clock, a sales leader therapy session. We've had hundreds of participants over the past couple of weeks and it's all about exchanging ideas. That's what we've got to do. We've got to exchange best practices and ideas because there are a lot of great ideas that are going to come out of this. And it's those people that are looking for it. You know, again, every time I listen to one of these things, Marsha, the fact that you came up with 40 new ideas in one hour, you know, there's a lot of brain power that we all have. And we just got to focus on what we can do. I know I'm repeating myself, but it's going to be okay, everybody. It is going to be okay. Just make sure that you're doing the right things because the worst thing is you're sitting there in the fall when it does turn around and your sales aren't where they needed to be, but you didn't think about proactively doing what you needed to do. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that we find is that um, a, a lot of times leaders and business people tend to be indecisive when they're feeling fear. And, and, and it's often easy to get past fear, right? Because fear is an emotion. It's emotion related to concern over something that hasn't happened. And so most of our fears go unfounded. But now we're in this mode where very few of us feared the pandemic and here it comes. And now we're not quite sure what to fear next. So when, you're, when one of your fears comes true, it's very much of a challenge to now put all the other fears aside and say, well, that's really not going to happen. And then you begin to sort of see things in a very, um, a very negative state, whether it's your negative state related to the fact that you're guilty because things aren't hitting you as hard or whether it's a negative state because you're not, um, you're, um, you're not optimistic about what it's going to take to move forward. Um, but in any of those cases, so, so the, the way I can maybe frame it the best is that those negative emotions, while, while it's difficult to prevent them from happening, um, they hinder our ability to move forward and recover um, from whatever the trauma is. Um, in this case, we're talking about, you know, the, the, the pandemic and the, and the business climate and the economic crisis. Um, but whatever in our lives are, are, are sort, of, uh, sort of created that, we don't move forward with the negative emotions. We move forward when we take accountability. And that's the really, so that for me, that's the big word. And Lisa, that's what I hear, you know, when you say things like, um, don't wing it, you got to be proactive. We've got to take accountability, right? right? We didn't make this pandemic happen. It's not our fault. We're not a, but we're not a victim of it. If we call ourselves victims, then we have all these negative emotions. Victims have negative, negative feelings. Um, so let's make ourselves accountable for it. And that empowers us now to be proactive and move forward. I, I you know, my father, who was a double amputee when he passed away, said, you don't have control about everything that happens to you in life. You have control how you handle it. And I listened to a podcast. Unfortunately, I can't um, give the proper credit to the person, but he said we've got control of our actions, our reactions, and our mindset. We have control over that. And there is a big difference we, between being willing, committed, and it is our mindset. And, you know, as long as we have our health and our loved ones have our health that get through this, then everything else is manageable and we'll deal with it. Because if, if that was the case, then all this other stuff wouldn't be a problem. So we really do have control and it's scary. And it's a lot of times we've got to switch the station in our head, especially when the worries start flooding in or we've got to compartmentalize and deal with one thing at a time, one moment at a time, and do the very best we can do because that's all we can do. Exactly. And one piece on the sales side I would add there that, that we're starting to like strategize with companies is, is expanding the reach of your sales function, meaning where before you thought you were in a specific niche helping certain companies or, or maybe a certain region I, we, we're kind of taking the, the, the stance that 
because the next six to nine months is going to be heavy remote for a lot of people, take advantage of that and, you know, branch out further for what you're offering. Ethically, geographically. Is that what you're talking about, Jeff? What is it? You're, you're speaking about branching out geographically? Branching out geographically because you can, because it's more virtual and you can use that to help fill some of your sales goals as well that we're, we're saying. So what, we, what we're advising on the financial side is on, if in salespeople or in dollars spent on technology or other things or marketing, positioning you online, like use some of those dollars for that, it should help you as well. So. I agree with that. And one of my clients that I was talking to today, he's trying to develop his top 50 list. And he, he was like kind of lost as far as how to expand and get that top 50 list together under the new circumstances. So we brainstormed three verticals. Then we brainstormed a couple other geographic areas that are just outside of the geographic area yeah. that he's been focusing on. And I just did a quick Google search while we were talking on the phone. And I came up with so many companies that are potential targets for him. Yeah. You know, his company, you know, take all the existing clients that are doing well and now duplicate them, figure out who's got the same profile and start targeting them. Because now when we're reaching out, we've got really good benefit statements and we're name dropping other people that we're able to help in their same industry. Yep. We're doing the same thing. We're actually, um, we put together a, a, what we call a target listing and of who are connected on LinkedIn and just reaching out to people and just having a communication. How are you? What's going on? And it's, it's not about the sale. It's about the relationship, but it's also building new ones and seeing what's happening. And, you know, two weeks ago, we got a phone call from someone saying, hey, she's a really good friend of mine. And um, I know she needs some recruiting help. She's really frustrated. Just have a call with her. And I said, absolutely. And um, we put everything together for her super fast. And she said, I have a board meeting tomorrow. Let's talk touch base tomorrow night. I said, absolutely. So I said, 5.30? She said, 5.30. I said, I called her at 5.30. And by the time we were done that conversation, she's like, yeah, we're going to move forward with you guys and do we get moving. You know, and I'm sitting there like, yes. But it was very fast turnaround. It was letting people know. They say to you, how can I help you? it's time for you to say, well, this is how you could help me. You know, if you could just give me people that you know who are struggling with those or this, just set up an introduction and I'll take care of the rest. And it's really awkward. I'm hearing from people too that it's a tough time for people. People, you know, people are losing loved ones right now. It's, it's a really sorrowful time and you have to really respect that. But it's also about surviving too. And so there's ways of doing it so it's not so tacky but it's also the fact that you're also helping take the pain away, which is the whole emphasis of sales. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I had an, another client that I was just talking to, he had a center of influence appointment, Zoom appointment, got a great layup of a company that was not happy with their packaging company. He just scored a half a million dollar opportunity, $64,000 this past month. Wow. Right? And just by having a center of influence meeting, and this literally happened this, this past week. So business is happening right now. And just making sure your center of influence is no more great introductions. Marsha, like today's, on today's call, you mentioned something that I had not thought about, but I think it's probably something that everybody needs. Everybody doesn't have an employee manual, but a work from home employee manual, an update to their employee manual. You know, there's a whole, I mean, to me, everybody needs something like that, you know? Yep. And I hadn't really even thought about that, quite honestly. That's why opportunity for innovativeness is huge right now, because we all haven't thought of this stuff before, so we didn't have to. Yeah. Good stuff. One of yeah. the things that we're hearing that um, is something that I've noted is a um, is something that everyone's relying on now that they didn't always that they weren't previously using is community. So Lisa, when you talk about you know center of influence or when we're even even at webinars like this, what people are looking for are being part of a community, being part of something bigger than them, 
getting an outside in perspective. And there was always, you know, we used to associate these with things like networking events where you had to go in and, you know, you know, just hope that serendipitously you would run into someone who was helpful. Um, or we would have these super niche, like, you know, BNI type groups where people would go and have lunch with the same people week after week. Well, we've become more creative about how to build that in, in this crisis. And that's been a really good thing because that's one of the things that I think people are appreciating now, beginning to appreciate the value of that. What do other people think? How can I help other people? My business is better. I'm a better leader when I'm part of something bigger, more broader, more diversity. Jeff, you've always been part of a tab group, I believe, right? And, mm -hmm. and I facilitate some tab groups, Marsha, you're an EO. Um, and these are, these are things that, um, you know, these are practices that given the time of crisis and a time of change and a, time, and a period of recovery afterwards where we need each other. And so hopefully as people are building them now, we're going to rely on them and, and feed them and, 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 um, and invest in them more when we're all, when we're on the other side of this. And giving more than thinking about taking, connecting mm -hmm. other people, mm -hmm. right? Being a connector, connecting them to the right people and not ever expecting tit for tat. And the other thing that I'm finding, and I'd love to hear the panels, but connecting with people, not just on a professional basis, but connecting people with people on a personal basis. I'm finding more so than ever. I'm starting off every conversation. I hope this finds you and your family safe and well. And really finding out who in their family is with them right now and connecting in a whole different way. And I think that, you know, one of my clients drove all the way down to Delaware. One of her clients was having a baby and she dropped off a dinner. Being able to do for people like that, you know, I think it's really form, forming these connections that are even bigger than what we might have done prior to this. You know, Lisa, I think you're right. Um, so one of the things we did last week is uh, to give back to the community. One of our taglines is um, hashtag connectors who care. And we really have that as our philanthropic unit as part of our team. But we've taken that to the nth degree and we've been trying to help out others so, and saying, what else can we do? So we actually had everybody put together, um, you know, a little, little thing that said, thank you, a little sign. And they had either their families or dog, you name it. And they put it all into um, to my marketing director. And then my son put together, he loves doing videos, put together this really cool video, of basically th thank you to first responders. And it's going out in social media today, um, later on today. But ironically enough, like it just pumped up my team so much so. And they were so excited to be a part of it, to be asked to do it. And the fact that it came together so nicely, um, my son can do this pretty quickly. So it it's, was easy to do, but for them, it motivated them to be like, we are in this together. We are giving back. We are helping others and all too. It's things like that that didn't cost us anything, but it really made a humongous impact, especially on my team and hopefully on social media once it goes out this afternoon. I love that stuff. I, you know, and don't we all feel good when we're helping somebody else out? And if you think about sales, it is all about helping and not selling anybody anything, you know, whether it be helping with their finances or their HR or their leadership or their sales, we're all about helping. And yep. that's, you know, why it's such a pleasure to be on this panel. And I'm not sure if you could see this. You can, but it's backwards. It's, right it's, <laughs> it's mirrored. It is backwards. Oh, I tried to write it. I, 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 <laughs> Zoom is too smart for you. Zoom has now reversed your reverse. It was. Well, I thought I, I thought I had to write it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome, Lise. That was great. <laughs> Memorable. Love it. You said at your last point, though, um, one of the things you well, one of the things you said just now was um, you're getting personal with your your clients, your your prospects, your partners. And, and, and you know, I, I would hope that all of our relationships that we're building in business are like that. Um, but I want to remind people now that you might not have to drive anywhere, that you got a little bit extra time. If you're not using a CRM system, start using a CRM system and make note of all of that. When you see someone's child or spouse or pet, write their name, find out how the world they are. Don't lose that information. Keep that information recorded because that's 
you know, when we talk about, you know, the charisma, the power, presence, and warmth that helps you be a leader and that helps you be a, a um, that helps you sell, then that's one of the attributes, right? The, the way to warmth is to be able to address people by name or, or remember people's birthdays. Um, and so um, record that information. You know, Mike, there's a question on there it's saying from Liz about what an easy, inexpensive CRM system to do, do you recommend? I can tell you that we use HubSpot, which I wouldn't say is the most um, expensive, but they are doing some massive, massive deals right now on a lot of these CRM systems just to have somebody use their stuff on all two. So you might want to just app, you know, do a tally out there with other people to see what they're using. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of inexpensive ones. I use the, I, we don't use HubSpot for marketing, but we use it for CRM. So therefore it's free. We have the free version of the CRM and I haven't, it's been better than any of the, you know, the small business low end paid ones that I've had in the past. Yep. There you go. So it's interesting that you said that Lisa too. I'll give you a really funny story. Um, we, we actually, our outsourced IT guys, we love them, but we had two questions about an invoice. And then they weren't getting back to us and we we're like, okay, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Well, the CEO comes to one of our free, we have um, Ask HR office hours from um, three to four every Thursday afternoon. And it's completely free. Anybody can join us on all two. And it's basically answering HR questions that they really can't afford to, to basically pay for right now. So we're trying to help out. Well, ironically, he was on the call last week and he asked, quite a few questions and we're like sure no problem we're going to answer them for him and he's like this was great well worth my time and ironically enough um he called my director of operations today to talk about those two invoices and we're getting him passed um basically he's he's taking him off from us because we were disputing something and he said no nah, no problem at all he just said that was totally well worth my hour of time so it's sort of like yin for yang but it, it does pay off in many ways love that story yes so 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 the attendees today have successfully allowed us to talk to each other for an hour. <laughs> I'm hoping that it was helpful to everyone else. Um, uh, the, um, we'll send out links like, so Marsha, it sounds like you have a, you have a, um, a webinar and Lisa, you have one, Jeff, you have one coming or? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm so sure. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll follow up with everyone with an email with those links. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's four o'clock. Um, Marsha, Lisa, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, everyone who participated, thank you. And um, we'll make a recording of this available uh, along with, with links to some of the resources and um, other events that, that are being hosted here. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, thank everyone. You, everybody. Be well. Thanks, bye -bye. guys. Stay safe. Bye-bye.